Amen. Well, before we, uh, we get started this morning, I, I want to update you a little bit uh, one, one last time regarding uh, the church plan in New Orleans. Uh, as you know, the core team has been running at breakneck speed just to wrap up life in New Orleans, and we've been, uh, over the last several weeks, experiencing a number of lasts constantly, it feels like. Last time with this family, last time in mis- this ministry, last time doing this or that, and that's been wonderful. Uh, the plan as it stands is, is to gather for the first time on November 12th still, and a couple Sundays uh, from now, and we will sing, fellowship, open up God's Word together, uh, and there are a number of, of people from different places, uh, different states here planning to be present in New Orleans for that first gathering, and so we will just celebrate what God's done uh, in getting us to that point, and then we're actually not going to meet for a, for a few weeks. Uh, we're going to meet the very next time and then permanently uh, starting at, uh, January 7th, the first Sunday in the new year. And that'll give us about seven weeks to catch our breath uh, from everything happening here, uh, to get our houses, our homes in order, to settle our families into the city a little bit and have just gotten really good counsel from other church planters to not jump into everything that church planting is going to demand and, and take some time to, to gather ourselves uh, beforehand. And so that's what we're going to do. We'll meet January, or November 12th and then start meeting permanently uh, January 7th. And in between those, that, those seven weeks, uh, we'll be fellowshipping with a, a really like-minded church, uh, some sweet relationships, have started to form uh, just across Lake Pontchartrain on the, the North Shore. And so we'll be, be gathering with the saints at the Field Church in between November 12th and January 7th. And so, as Kyle mentioned, we are departing uh, next week, uh, next Monday, so a week from tomorrow. And uh, just really uh, eager for that. Uh, the most common question I get is, are you excited? And it's probably not the word to describe (laughs) how I feel. I am excited, but about as excited as you can be to go do the hardest thing you're probably ever going to do. And and so I'm eager for it, uh, eager most of all to just open up God's word and see lives transformed, uh, the very things that we've seen happen at this church for some decades now, uh, eager to to start running in that same direction, and hopefully when we look up 20 years from now, uh, can, can see something similar as we see in Tempe. Uh, this morning, what we're going to hear, the place in God's Word that we're going to hear from is 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. So turn in your Bible there. And we're really going to zoom in to the last sentence of the entire book of 1 Timothy. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 21b. The Apostle Paul writes, Grace be with you. Grace be with you. The text of today's sermon includes the last four words of Paul's letter to his son in the faith, Timothy. Uh, This is a profound statement made by the apostle, grace be with you. But it's one that we likely skip over or rush past because of its commonness of the sentiment expressed. If you've been in the church reading your New Testament for a while, this is not an uncommon phrase expressed throughout the New Testament. And so because of that commonness, it's often easy to rush by 
But the profundity of the statement is really so subtle that it is easily missed. But it, this is an important part of this incredible letter. This is Paul's final word in this letter, and how fitting for me that it would be my final word to you as well. I can't think of a, a more glorious subject to meditate on to put before you this morning, this last time, than the subject of God's grace. What we're going to see in this passage is five details that demonstrate the significance of grace for the church. Five details that demonstrate the significance of grace for the church. Let me pray and ask for God's blessing on this time. God, what a gracious Savior you are, one who loves to save because of the regard that you have for your own namesake, the regard that you have for your own reputation, and to put your greatness on display, you have chosen not just to judge, not just to command, but God, you have chosen to rescue men and women, to rescue individuals from a variety of backgrounds, nations, ethnicities, personalities, preferences. And God, you have united us into a called out, gathered people, the church, your own family. How amazing, how marvelous. Yeah, we can hardly express appropriate gratitude for such a gift, such kindness. It's almost enough to leave us speechless, but only almost. We have much that we ought to say about this subject of your grace. And so now I, I pray that you would make me clear in my speech, that you would prepare the hearts of those gathered here to hear this word of your grace and that all of us together would be thrust further into deeper love uh, for you, uh, love for one another, uh, pure motivation to pursue one another and see your work accomplished in all of us together. And we ask all these things, not for our own sake, not for our own comfort, but for the glory of Christ's name alone. Amen. Five details in Paul's epilogue demonstrate the significance of grace for the church Five details that we're going to see this morning in this final word, this epilogue, that demonstrate the significance of grace for the church. Number one, the scope. Notice the scope of this final word coming from the Apostle Paul. Grace be with you. You. Not immediately apparent in the English, because whether you're referring to one person or multiple people, use, use the same word, you, unless you're living in the South, and you say y'all. So the plural is distinguished from the singular in Southern vernacular. Grace be with y'all is an accurate reflection of what's in the Greek text. Grace be with y'all. So this is the scope of this word, this final word that Paul has. This is meant for everyone. God's grace to be with absolutely everyone of God's household. This is for everyone in the church. And this is really why Paul is writing. Uh, this is a distinct word from what else he has said in the letter. Uh, this single sentence is unique in the book of 1 Timothy because it is the only second-person plural 
in the entire letter. It's the only reference to y'all in the entire book. Everything else has really its reference point as one man, and that is Pastor Timothy. (laughs) And this is why Paul wrote this letter to Timothy. He's writing to Timothy so that Timothy would confidently shepherd the various members of the church to practice what I like to call piety produced love. And we'll get to what all that means. But what Paul is pushing for, the ultimate goal, is that the various members of Christ's church would love one another, that they would practice true biblical grace-fueled love. In the departure points, as you may call it, the, the places from which this love ought to come, you could sum up as piety. Uh, we'll get to that in chapter 1, verse 5. We'll look at that before we finish. But from a pious or a holy or a godly life, Paul wants all of the church to be shaped by the teaching and shepherding so that they practice from this holy or godly life, this pious life, love. So this is a piety-produced love that the church ought to be practicing. And so all of the instructions really filter down to the church through Pastor Timothy as the one leading the church. So Paul is writing so that Timothy would confidently shepherd the various members of the church to practice piety produced love. Uh, Really, Timothy is somewhat unique in the New Testament, among the New Testament epistles, because it interestingly addresses every single member of the church in some way, shape, or form. Just flip back, and I'll show you this briefly. From the opening of the letter, Paul includes this first group, the men teaching error. Men teaching error. Verse 6, notice some, that is some men, straying from these things have turned aside to fruitless discussion. This is a reference to the teaching It is fruitless. It does not produce what God is after in the life of his church. And so all of chapter 1 really becomes a word to Timothy for that first group, the false teachers. This is according to verse 3 in chapter 1, why Timothy was left by Paul in Ephesus. As I exhorted you, verse 3, when going to Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus, so that you, this is Timothy, may command certain ones not to teach a different doctrine, or in most translations, a strange doctrine. Different is the better translation. This isn't like they were teaching something outlandish or bizarre, but just different, other stuff in the church that proved fruitless. It did not bear fruit in God's people because it was not what God had included in his word. It was not the doctrine that accorded with the gospel and with the rest of the scriptures, so it should not have been taught. Look at verse 4. They were giving their attention, these men, to myths, endless genealogies. And what did it do? It gave rise to mere speculation instead of the very thing that God entrusted to his church, the stewardship that's from God by faith. So all of those who believe have a stewardship that this error, this false teaching, did not accomplish. So false teachers are addressed first. All the way down through the end of chapter 1, this is still Paul's subject. Everything fits in that context for that group, because verse 20, the end of chapter 1 ends, says, Among these are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, so that they will be taught not to blaspheme. They were two of the men prominent in the church, teaching error, who would not let go of their false teaching. So before Paul left and went to Macedonia, he handed these men over to Satan. He put them out of the church so that, with the hopes that, they would repent of their 
false doctrine. Notice further in chapter 2, another group addressed specifically chapter 7, or verse, verse uh, 7 and 8, As he tasked the church to pray in a certain way, who's supposed to lead in that? Verse 8, the men. I want, therefore, the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. So he addresses the men as another category of people. And then the very next verse, the women are in view. They ought to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly. And with self-restraint, not with braiding hair, gold, pearls, costly clothing, etc. So the men and the women are in view. And then Paul gives further instructions to Timothy with what to what to do with elders. Chapter three, verse one. It's a trustworthy saying. If a man aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a good work. An overseer, therefore, must be. And then you get a list of elder qualifications. So what to do with elders, the kind of men who ought to be appointed as elders? Timothy, here's who who they are, how you know who they are. Verse 8 in chapter 3, deacons are the next category of people in view and what they must be. And then just notice in verse 14 and 15, still as he talks about the conduct of the entire congregation, Who's in view? These are, this is all coming to Timothy. I am writing these things to you, Timothy, hoping to come to you, Timothy, soon. But in case I am delayed, Paul says, I write so that you, Timothy, will, will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God. As the one primarily teaching the church, leading in his shepherding, Timothy must know what all the church is required to do. Again, chapter 4, false teachers are in view. Those who would uh, lead others to fall away from the faith. In verse 2, Paul calls them liars. They are hypocrites. Their consciences are seared, he says. And then he addresses Timothy in the rest of chapter 4 specifically. How to be a faithful servant as he shepherds. Chapter 5, the next group in view, widows, in verses 3 and following. You have a specific word, two widows, what to do with them, how to honor them, uh, especially those who are widows indeed, fits the category or the specifics of what a true widow is. Also in chapter 5, just prior to the widows, older men, Younger men, older women, younger women, how to bring correction to each of those people. Again, chapter 5, verse 17, elders are in view. What to do with elders, how to think about elders, those who teach, uh, those who lead, those who are in the office fulfilling their duties full time is what's in view, how to remove elders, how to lay on uh, hands to elders and appoint them to the work later in chapter 5. You even have in chapter 6, verse 1, those who are slaves in view. Timothy needs to know what ought to be happening with them. And then again, obviously this is prominent on Paul's mind, you have verse 3, those who would teach a different doctrine, those who would teach error, still in Paul's scope. You have the rich in view as well, sort of to end this chapter, how to command them, how to instruct them, what to do with their wealth, not to rely on it, how to be charitable, etc. And then finally, a word to everyone, grace be with y'all. So every group gets addressed, but through Timothy as the one leading and shepherding, and this word is indispensable because it comes to everyone. It's unique, but again, simply indispensable to what Paul is doing, as we'll see.
So that's the scope of this epilogue. This belongs to everybody. This is to, specifically to everyone, not only for everyone. Also notice not only the scope, but the setting. The setting. Where does this come? Last. Last. You know, if Paul had a final word, this would be it. A word about God's grace. What does he want ringing in their ears as the very last concern that he has for the church? A word about God's grace that demonstrates something of the significance of God's grace for the church. It's the very last thing that Paul wants on their minds, ringing in their ears. So he concludes in a word to the church, again, distinct from what else Paul has said to Timothy. I want you to just make one other observation about this concluding word. Just notice the concluding word is a word about God's grace. It's helpful to notice when you're reading your Bible what sometimes become bookends in a, in a given book. If an author ends the same way that he begins, then you can conclude that the way he begins and ends what he's writing, if it's the same, everything in between has some sort of relationship to how it began and end, ended. So look at, again, chapter 1, just flip back. We know the letter ends with a word about God's grace. How does it begin? 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2 This is Paul the Apostle of Christ Jesus, according to the commandment of God our Savior writing, and according to the commandment of Christ Jesus our hope. He says, this is to Timothy, verse 2, who is my genuine child in the faith, or you could say in faith. What? Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace. The initial, the first and beginning word to Timothy is grace. An expression of his desire for Pastor Timothy of grace. That grace would be to him or belong to him. And as well as God's grace, he has mercy and peace. All of these attributes of God, these things coming from God, these are really the resources that Timothy is going to need in his shepherding. You just follow the flow of the book. Does Timothy need grace to help guard the church alongside the other elders of the Ephesian church from false teaching to help children know what to do with widows, to instruct men, to instruct women, to instruct the rich, to appoint elders, to appoint deacons and rightly order all of God's family under God's good guidance. Absolutely. What does Timothy need most? Grace, mercy, and peace. And so what Timothy needs as a faithful shepherd, grace, so does the rest of the church, grace. The letter begins and ends with a word about God's grace, an expression of the desire of the apostles, uh, really hope or desire for them, is that God's grace would be with them, would equip them, would strengthen them, would sustain them. And so everything that's written here, all of the conduct of the the various members of the church, as well as uh, how Timothy, the other shepherds, ought to be shepherding, What's necessary is God's grace. Notice not only the scope and the setting of these words, but also the singularity of these final words, the singularity. Uh, This is what I've already mentioned, that this is the only word that comes directly to the entire church. All of the instructions are for the church, but this is the only one that comes to, directly to the entire church. 
And so if Paul had one thing to say to the church, one burden to leave them with, it would be regarding God's grace is the point. That tells you something about the importance or the significance of grace to the church. It's the one thing that Paul says directly to the entire church. By implication, that informs us of the role or the placement that God's grace ought to have in our own minds, in our own life, in our own conversation as a church. It ought to be at the forefront, not on the back burner. It ought to be at the forefront of our minds, God's grace, what it does, what it's done, what it will do, what it is aiming at accomplishing among us. We'll get to that. But if this is the singular only word Paul has to the church, then it tells you something about the prominence that God's grace has in the church, ought to have in the church, and the burden that, burden that it is for Paul. Fourthly, not only the scope, setting, singularity, you can add to this the shape, the specific shape that this epilogue takes. Uh, these are not mere parting words. When we talk about the shape that this takes, he doesn't just, he's not just saying, see you later, see you soon, when he says, grace be with you. So this is not a mere closing word. It's not a mere salutation, departing statement. Notice what else this is not. This is not a command. Grace be with you is not a command. It's not an imperative. He doesn't say, receive grace, church, or be with grace. He doesn't even say that. Be with grace, church. Lay hold of God's grace, church. So it's not a command. It's not a closing word, a mere salutation. And it's not even a truth claim. Grace is with you. He doesn't say that, does he? Grace is with you, church. I mean, that is true. Wherever you find Christians gathered, God's grace must be present. Otherwise, they, would, otherwise they wouldn't be Christians. So grace has come to them for sure. But this is in the present, right now, a burden of Paul. It's an expression of a desire. Grace be with you. As if he's saying, may grace be with you. I desire that grace would be with you. And just notice, he's, he's talking to the household of God. Hasn't grace already come? Isn't it sufficient? Well, yes, if you're talking about salvation, it has come. It is sufficient to save. And yet Paul tells called out, gathered Christians, grace is still necessary. The grace you received at salvation, it's my desire as an apostle sent from Christ himself that you would continually have grace extended to you, present with you, that you would still find yourselves attached to God's grace with you, that it would be with you today, right now, in the present, all together. All y'all would have God's grace with you. That's his burden. The shape that these words take, the, the shape that the epilogue takes is an apostolic burden for the church specifically in Ephesus. This is his sincere desire for a kind of present active attachment of God's grace to them. Grace be with y'all. And so fifthly, that just brings us finally to, to focus on, lastly, the subject of these few words, of these four words, the subject, grace. What is the final and the only burden that Paul communicates directly to every member of the church in Ephesus, 
It's this, I want the grace of God inseparably attached to y'all. I want God's grace to be clearly present in all of your endeavors. I want the unique favor of God at work in your lives as you represent the Savior and uphold his truth in the world in your love for one another that comes from a pious life. Grace, that's what's necessary. That's my burden for you. He doesn't just take it as a given that, hey, because you're gathered, because you um, might have the right systems in, pr- in place, structured rightly as a church, God's grace is going to be there. You need this. It's a burden of mine that you experience God's grace and that you have or witness its attachment to you. So finally, number five, the, the subject. We need to to consider what is the subject of this apostolic burden for the church in Ephesus. I share this burden for you, Grace Bible Church. As we leave and I let go of any influence I have among you, really, right? As a shepherd, living among you, involved in your lives here in Tempe, Arizona, it's going to end in a few days from now. I'm burdened for you. That grace would be with you. That grace would accomplish what it desires to accomplish in the church for for decades longer. (laughs) Decades of faithfulness because God's kindness is at work in us. And so we need to know what exactly Paul has in view when he mentions this word of grace. Just consider the definition of God's grace. What is God, God's grace? If you're a Christian, you know this well. This is God's kindly, uh, favorable, beneficent disposition toward you, Christian. It's his kindness to you. It's a kindness that you couldn't earn, that you don't deserve, not in the past, not in the present, not in the future. You could never earn it. There's one individual to whom the grace of God belonged by right. It is Jesus. The goodness of God, the kindness of God, he earned it. It belonged to him. He knew it. It was inherent to him. We don't deserve this. We are sinners by nature. We have offended God. We are in danger of God's wrath without his grace. This is God's undeserved favor, his unearned kindness toward us. And what this disposition, this favorable disposition toward us from God, only because of God, having nothing to do with us, what this resulted in was then kind gestures, acts of kindness, toward us, this grace, this kindness. And you can put right at the top of that list, salvation in Christ, the cross, is, is primarily in view. Just flip back. Paul knows this. So in chapter 1, verse 12, notice when he speaks about or considers as one who was in error himself, when he thinks about the men who are teaching error in Ephesus with perverted consciences from a wrong heart, a hypocritical faith, one that claims to love the scriptures and yet teaches contrary to the scriptures from that kind of seared conscience, he can't help but think of himself as a model of hope for those men because he was such a one. And so he says in the midst of that context about men teaching error, verse 12, I am grateful. When he thinks about what God has done for him, he cannot help but call to mind his own gratitude. I am thankful to Christ Jesus, Messiah Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he regarded me faithful putting me in the service, even though 
I was formerly a blasphemer and a perse persecutor and a violent aggressor. Yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. This, this ignorance that Paul is speaking about is not an innocent ignorance. It is a culpable ignorance. It is not an excuse to explain, hey, God showed me mercy because he could see. I just didn't know what I was doing. Poor me. No, that's not the idea. Because notice, his ignorance was rooted deep where? In what? His own unbelief. And that's always the way that a, a culpable, willful ignorance works. We are culpable when we don't believe God and the resulting ignorance is our fault. We, we don't know because we don't believe, right? If we believed, we would know. You can go back and read the book of Proverbs. This is the way it works. The, 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 the strange woman, prostitute mentioned in chapter 6, is ignorant. It's a shining characteristic. What, why is she ignorant? Because she's bent on pursuing sin. She chooses to not believe God's word, chooses to not obey his commandments regarding sexual morality, sexual purity, and so she lacks wisdom. She lacks knowledge. She is ignorant. She does not know things. This is the, the kind of ignorance that Paul is meaning. And so his position that he was in, ignorant as he was, because he refused to submit to God's will and believe God, believe the scriptures that he was claiming, God pitied him. You pathetic sinner. I'm going to show you pity. I'm going to show you mercy. I'm going to be compassionate toward you. Anyone who has ever been saved, you might not have been a violent aggressor persecuting the church, but we all stand with Paul in this. We have the same need, the compassion of God toward us because of our ignorance, because of our unbelief. All those who have experienced this compassion, this mercy, notice verse 14, what else came to them? What else comes to us like it came to Paul? The grace of our Lord. The grace of our Lord. Wherever mercy comes, so does grace. And he says that this grace came in no small measure. Praise God. It was more than abundant. What do you call more than abundant? I don't know. Hyperabundant, superabundant, extra, extra abundant. In abundant times, infinity, that's the idea. It was more than abundant with the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Wherever mercy and grace are at work, you will find the faith and love found in Christ Jesus. This is God's grace. This is the, the definition, if you will, that he has in mind when he says, grace to you, grace be with you. It's that grace, the uh, abundant grace. This is a, a lavish or abundant grace. This is also a sacrificial, humble, initiating grace. Because notice the very next thing he says, as he considers this mercy and grace that have come to him, verse 15 is this trustworthy saying that's deserving of full acceptance. It is worthy of being received without any inkling of doubt that what? Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's what's worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. So the grace that Paul has in mind that must continue to attach itself to the church so that the church is successful and faithful in all that God has tasked the church with doing, 
it resulted in the salvation of sinners because this is why Christ came. This is an act, an expression of God's kindness that's not deserved. It's God's unmerited favor or grace towards sinners, that Christ Jesus, God, all glorious, would come into the world, would step out of heaven, leave his throne in heaven, veil his glory in human flesh so that he might become the sin-bearing substitute under God's wrath, rescuing sinners. That's a a sacrificial grace. That's a a kindness not willing uh, to, to just regard itself, to hold on to its own preferences, its own glory. It would endure the ultimate sacrifice so that it can express God's kindness towards sinners. Death under God's wrath for the sake of the salvation of sinners. It's humble. The great God stepping out of heaven. This is what grace motivated Christ to do. How kind is God? So kind, it would, it would die for your sins, Christian. That humble. This is the initiating grace. Paul wasn't looking for this. He was not looking for a crucified Messiah. He rejected a crucified Messiah. He hated the idea of a crucified Messiah, and so did you. Every Christian, right? You had to come to the place where you thought, wait, I have no righteousness. I'm so bad, God himself has to die for me in the person of Jesus Christ. I can't be righteous. I remember the first time I had that thought. I had spent my life growing up in a Christian home and still holding on to my righteousness, thinking I was good because I wasn't doing what other people were around me were doing, right? I had nothing to do with the privileges that I had growing up in a two-parent home that protected me from my own sin and the sin in my environment. And yet I took pride in that. I hung my hat on something I had nothing to do with and called it my own righteousness. It wasn't righteousness. It was self-righteousness. It was a worthless righteousness. It was a fruitless righteousness. This initiating grace becomes beloved to all God's people. And as we've already seen, it's a a fitting righteousness. It, It just goes hand in hand with all that God is and all that God would do. Grace goes hand in hand with mercy. Grace goes hand in hand with love. Grace goes hand in hand with faith produced by God. Where does this grace come from? Again, go back to chapter 1. We just stay close to the context. When Paul says, grace be with you, what grace, what what are the sources of grace that he has in mind? Chapter 1, verse 2. From where do grace, mercy, and peace come? Well, they come from, he mentions two sources. First, God the Father. And second, Christ Jesus our Lord. This is God the Son. Grace comes from God the Father and God the Son. How could it be any other way? Whose kindness is it? It's theirs. They share this kindness. Notice they they must be equal in their, their essence because these qualities come from both of them, not one more than the other, so that when God the Father shows mercy, shows kindness, establish his peace, so is God the Son doing the same things. Notice this is from God the Father. Father of what? You're not a father unless you have children, a child. Certainly God the Son would be included in this, but God is so lavish in his kindness, uh, so great, that he united with God the Son, other sons. Look at chapter 3. This is what we read in verse 15. In case I am delayed, Paul says, he 
he says, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church, the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. God has a household, i.e. a family. Just like verses earlier in chapter 3, verse 5, an elder must know how to lead his own household, his own family is all the word means. Elders have households most often, most commonly. They have to know how to lead them. Well, God also has a family. He has a household. He has sons whom he has saved. He has shown grace to them. And so what's necessary for this family? God's continued kindness and attachment to this undeserved kindness. Finally, I just want us to consider the, as we think about this subject of God's grace, this burden that Paul has for the church all together, corporately, that grace would be attached inseparably to them. Why does he want grace inseparably attached to the church? What is the church supposed to be doing that they are in such desperate, continual need of God's ongoing kindness? And this is where I want to direct your attention, again, beginning of the letter, to chapter 1, verse 5. This is what Paul calls the stewardship from God, which is by faith in verse 4. You know, the, the false teachers, the men teaching error, their teaching, all it accomplished was more questions in the body, speculation even, in the body, so that they were being taught in such a way that when they went home, after the preaching and teaching of God's word, they were just speculating about the scriptures. They gained no clarity They didn't go home, chapter and verse, this is clear, here's what I'm supposed to be doing. They were just going to be reading in the white spaces. Hey, I wonder about this. What about this? Oh, there's no answers to this. This would be interesting to think about. Speculation. That's not healthy in the Christian life. That's not a sign of spiritual health. It gave rise, verse 4, to mere speculation rather than the stewardship from God, which is by faith. In other words, what God has given those who believe to be about, to be doing. What is that? Well, he tells us in verse 5, it's the very thing that Paul and Timothy's instruction aim at. The goal of our instruction, our command is what? Love from a pure heart and a good conscience and an unhypocritical faith. This is what the church is supposed to be doing. This is the stewardship entrusted by God to every child of God who believes. Love from this kind of life, pure heart, good conscience, unhypocritical or sincere faith. The heart, the conscience, the faith, things you can't see, you can't hold, you can't touch, you can't taste, right? They are unseen things. These must be purified by the instruction from God's word. Preaching, teaching, wherever it happens in the church, must be aiming at this one thing. Love from a sanctified life, from a pious, godly life. So the the teaching and preaching of God's word has to shape the souls of the children of God in the church, has to shape the household of God, so that godliness is being produced in the lives of the the saints. If your understanding of God's grace is aiming at something other than godliness, we're not talking about God's grace. It's a different grace, likely a different God you have in mind, who doesn't desire godliness in his people. What's God aiming at? What is he entrusted, given to us to do? Well, it must come from a godly life, a pure heart, a good conscience, 
and a sincere faith. And to do what with those things? To look around at each other and say, isn't it great that we're godly? No. To bask in our godliness? No. But to love, to love, to step into each other's lives, to serve one another, to encourage one another, to comfort one another, to sustain weak hands in one another, to spur one another on to love and good deeds. That's what love does. This is a practical outflow, outworking of love amongst God's people. And if Grace Bible Church is going to be faithful in the future, if God's grace continues to remain attached to this congregation, it will be proven if this church continues on in piety produced love, in love from a pure heart and a good conscience and sincere faith in the members. This is my burden for you. This was Paul's burden for the Ephesians. That grace would be with you doing this very thing. As you think about these lofty truths, you know, what, what to take away from, from such a, a word from Paul? Grace be with y'all. Let me just say to, to those perhaps among us uh, living with an impure heart, a wrong or bad conscience, and a hypocritical faith, what you need most is grace. You need God's grace. You need to be saved by God's grace. You need to be rescued from a continual practice of a perverted inner life. You need God to remake you into a new human being. You need a remade soul. And the only thing that can do that, you can't do that for yourself. How can you who are accustomed to doing evil do anything else? How can you change? You can't. Who can say, I have made my part, heart pure? I'm clean from my sin. No one. I couldn't say that. I can't say that. You can't say that, Christian. And you, unbeliever, cannot say that. You need God's grace. And so ask God to save you, not because of anything you could do, but only because of his kindness that he loves to put on display when he saves sinners. Plead for that. That's the best you can do. It's just to ask him, give it to me, please, because I'm hopeless. I'm helpless. You can also be humbled by God's grace, all of us. We should be humbled by this to know that the only thing that can accomplish this in us is the, this, the unmerited kindness of God. All of our works, all of our programs, all of our good plans, all of our efforts, if grace is lacking in them, we fail. Doesn't matter what, how good the program, doesn't matter how good the plan, we can lay out as we have a great way of training men. And yet if God's grace is lacking, if we start to depend on the mechanism rather than God's unmerited kindness to us, we will fail. If you in your own life start to look at how well you're doing and focus on your own resources, like Peter sinking when he took his eyes off Christ, you will fail. God's grace must humble us so that it remains at the forefront of our thoughts. We should aim to grow in a knowledge of God's grace so that we are ever increasing in gratitude for God's kindness. We should remind one another of this kindness that's been extended to us by God. Past grace, present grace, future grace that's coming. Get better at communicating these truths to your children, to your spouse, to your friends, to your family members in this body.
And we should pursue the goal that God's grace is after. Piety produce love. Aim at that in all of your encouragements, in all of your exhortations and admonishments. You teachers in the church, in all of your teachings, be aiming at this singular pursuit to form godliness in the souls of those who hear you so that they become better lovers of God, better lovers of God's household, and better lovers of others. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you, thank you for these truths. We would be hopeless. We are hopeless. We are helpless without your kindness. And so I pray for this church. It's in our name. Let us be faithful to the name that we bear here in Tempe and there in New Orleans. Would you just be kind to make your grace work in us, have its way in us so that your grace is put on display for all the world to see that we might all together marvel at what a kind guy you are. Amen.